Okay, I guess it's uh, 15 minutes past, so let's start. So I'll introduce this. Is, uh, we're very happy to have um, Max uh, here speaking today. Uh, Max is a postdoc in the department. He just started this fall. Um, and before that, he was a PhD student in, in Copenhagen, and he spent some time uh, during his PhD at MIT as well. And Max has uh, done a lot of incredible work lately on uh, adaptive uh, dynamic algorithms and on uh, single source shortest path, a lot of stuff. And today he's going to talk about some very cool work with Thatch Paul and Aaron Bernstein uh, on... Um, Directed expander decomposition and a lot of applications. Too. So thanks, Max. Thanks for that. Yes, exactly. Uh, this is joint work together with Aaron Bernstein from Rutgers and with uh, Tetsuo Saranarak, who's somewhere between Chicago and Michigan in transition. Uh, and the talk is going to be about two really cool techniques. Uh, the first one is directed expander decomposition. So this brings expanders to directed graphs. And the second one is the technique of congestion balancing. That's an entirely new technique. And uh, this technique is will, uh, helps a lot to maintain expanders very efficiently. And along the way, I will give a really cool application. So we had a very specific application in mind for these two techniques um, that I will show to you. But I think the two techniques are really very general, and I really hope that they are used in for very different problems that we couldn't think of and lead to some progress there. All right. I'll start with the applications, um, and I'll delve right into a problem. So this is a problem that we had in mind so for solving. Um, it's the decremental single source reachability problem. Uh, short SSR, and in this problem you're given a vertex S, so your special source, and you're given a graph G, and your graph G, uh, initially only a, a normal graph, that you get is slowly undergoing a sequence of edge deletions. And the objective in this setting is that you uh, design an algorithm that processes every edge deletion one at a time, and then outputs thereafter whether S, your source vertex, can still reach all the vertices. So for example, in the right-hand graph, you can see that S can reach all the vertices of this graph, but then this graph undergoes edge deletions, and here already the first edge deletion, for example, might delete the graph so that S can no longer reach a bunch of vertices, and from there on, your algorithm should output no S cannot reach all the vertices in the graph. And a slightly more complicated or advanced problem here that is very similar in spirit is the problem of decremental SCCs. So here you're again given an initial graph G, um, but you're not given a fixed source vertex. Here you're just given that graph, and now the the objective is to, again, propose uh, process every edge deletion and output after every edge deletion whether the entire graph G is one giant strongly connected component or not. And just a reminder for those who forgot what a strongly connected component or short SCC is. Um, we essentially say that two vertices are strongly connected. So here at U and V, for example, are strongly connected if they are on a common cycle. So if U can reach V and V can reach U, then these two vertices are strongly connected. And a strongly connected component is just a maximum set of vertices that are all pairwise strongly connected. So here, for example, it looks like this. And this is actually a unique uh, partition of the vertex set of the graph. All right. And for these problems, um, these seem like very fundamental problems uh, in these graphs undergoing edge deletions. And they have uh, a lot of applications. Also, the more advanced versions of these problems have a lot of very interesting applications. But there has, we have been kind of stuck in the setting for deterministic algorithms 
which are really important for us because they are also adaptive. So I'll jump right into, oh, actually I prepared some deletion for this one as well. Uh, I'll just go through the deletion. So in the strongly connected case, uh, component case, the grass is also undergoing the edge deletions um, until this grass kind of breaks into multiple co strongly connected components and your algorithm should report after the specific edge deletion that this that it first broke off into multiple uh, SECs uh, that G is no longer one entire big SEC. Now to the results. Uh, as I said here, I'm gonna focus on deterministic algorithms for these two problems. And there's only three algorithms around. So first one, there's one from the 80s, from 1981 by Evan and Chilouac. And this algorithm takes total time M times N over the entire sequence of edge deletions. So here you're given a graph uh, that initially has M edges and then one edge after another is deleted and over this entire edge deletion sequence, the algorithm spends of M N time. And the algorithm by Evan and Chilouac uh, is actually only for the single source reachability problem. But in uh, 2011, Wonski kind of gave a, a variation of this that is very uh, neat and very nice and gets the same running time for strongly connected components in the setting. But given these two algorithms, there has really not been any progress in a deterministic setting beyond this MN uh, barrier. And this is considered a very hard barrier for a multitude of problems in the decremental setting. And in this talk, I'm, I'm going to show you how to actually break this bound and to make some progress. So in particular, we get roughly m times n to the power of two third total running time um, for these two problems. And before I continue, I'll just point out that in the randomized setting, this is actually very well understood. So just last year, uh, we found an algorithm that runs in near linear time. So the total update sequence is processed in uh, of M time roughly. Mm. Yeah, I will, like for the rest of the talk also, I will uh, suppress uh, polylogarithmic and subpolynomial factors just because we have a lot of them and it will be very inconvenient to say that, state them any time. But essentially in the randomized setting, we have a good understanding but it's not very useful for, for us. Like ultimately we really want deterministic data structures for all our, our applications. All right. Now I'm going over to the second part and here I just want to introduce uh, an expander decomposition hmm. and actually show why this is useful for the SEC problem. Now, just as a reminder where what an expander is, I will go back to undirected graphs. So in undirected graphs, oh, and for people who know expanders actually a bit better, here I will focus on a vertex version of expanders. So in particular, I will define a vertex sparse cut to be a cut S and not S. So this is a B partition of the vertex set S and not S where S is always the smaller side. Um, and in this undirected graph G, we say that this cut is phi sparse if the out neighborhood of the, uh, of the set S is smaller than phi times the number of vertices in S. So in particular, you can see in the example below that there's a lot of edges that are uh, parallel to each other. So probably they reach a larger out neighborhood in not S and thereby probably this is not a sparse cut. This seems quite well connected, but if there was only a single edge going from S to not S, then the out neighborhood would be very small and this would be a sparse cut. And for phi here, you should really think of something that is way smaller than one. So for example, one over square root N is a classic typical value for phi here or at least one over polylog n. All right. Now, once you're given, once you know what a sparse cut is, um, you might wonder whether 
what use is this? So there's a very special family of graphs um, that we call phi expanders. And we say that a graph G is a phi expander if there's no spa phi sparse cut in this entire graph. So these are graphs that are very well connected um, and it's very easy for every, for every uh, subset of vertices S to go to not S and from not S to go to S. There's a lot of disjoint paths, essentially. And given this, um, there's a, a nice decomposition that has a lot over the last years, and this is the phi decomposition. And given a graph G, uh, given the graph G, you can actually find a bunch of disjoint vertex subsets, x1, x2, and x3, and so on. Uh, and each of these vertex subsets, xi, if you take the induced graph G of xi, then this induced graph is a phi expander. And the vertices that are not in any phi expander um, is very few. So there's only order phi n vertices that are not in any such expander. Uh, and uh, remember that phi here is going to be something way smaller than one. Hmm? So in this example below, you see that there's a bunch of very well-connected subgraphs, these complete or near-complete graphs, but they are connect. the graph as a whole is not very well-connected. But this decomposition tells you at least you can take out some of the, the vertices, the red vertices, and the connected parts or the connected subgraphs uh, that you obtain then are extremely well-connected graphs. Uh, here I will just remove these. Uh, yes. okay. I'll, I'll go to the directed setting and here uh, it's a bit different, right? Because we saw that uh, non-sparse cut in the undirected setting, but if you look at a cut now from here, given S and not S again, all the edges that leave S might essentially point away from S. So essentially the the out neighborhood of S, leaving S, is very easy. But on the other hand, this does, just because there's a lot of edges between S and not S, this does not mean that it's easy to go from not S to S. So the in neighborhood of S might be very small and it might be very hard to get into S. And in this talk, this is something bad because this is, for us intuitively, this is not a very well connected graph. So we change our definition of a sparse cut to be a directed sparse cut if, again, S here is the smaller side of the uh, cut, uh, if in a directed graph, uh, the out neighborhood of S or the in neighborhood of S is smaller than phi times the number of the vertices in S. And then you can define a directed phi expander exactly the same way. Uh, phi expander here is a uh, directed phi expander here is just a graph that contains no phi sparse cut. Now the second thing you might want to ask is, is there some kind of expander decomposition in, in directed graphs? And this is something that has not been explored at all. So even this concept, conceptual thing has not existed so far, but we found like some notion at least of the phi expander decomposition that seems quite useful. So in particular, given the graph, you can again find a bunch of disjoint vertex subsets such that each induced graph of these on these vertex sets is a directed phi expander. And you can again find a set R of vertices that you can remove from the graph. But now, after removing these edges, for, uh, these vertices from the graph and um, contracting all the expander graphs, the remaining graph will be a DAG, so a directed acyclic graph. And I'll have a drawing for this. So this is a slightly more messy picture than the picture we saw in the undirected case. Um, but you can there's still a bunch of very good, um, uh, of, of, of very directed subgraphs. So you can again find some expanders 
And then in between them, you have again some red vertices. And after taking them out, the rest of the graph is just a deck. And this is actually the best you can do because the input, the graph G, could be uh, just a tournament graph, so some kind of complete deck in the first place. And then you cannot take a single expander and you are just there with n uh, vertices that. Uh, that are not well connected at all. Um, but this gives like at least some sensible notion for a expanded uh, for an expander decomposition in directed graphs. All right. And I want to point out something that that is kind of obvious from this, uh, and that is in this directed phi expander decomposition for G. If you look at the vertex sets that form an expander, since a vertex expander is now something that is very well connected and you can go from one vertex to another very easily, um, it's easy to see that each of these expanders is an SCC, so a strongly connected component. In particular, since the expanders are disconnected from each other, once you take out the set of uh, vertices in R, you know that these vertex subsets are actually the SECs in the graph G where you've deleted the vertices in R. All right. And I'll give the main theorem that I'm trying to prove in this talk. Um, and it's an idealized main theorem. So what I'm now going to say is actually not entirely true, but it's kind of close. So we will just have this theorem and I will maybe explain later what we cannot do here. But the main theorem is essentially that given a decremental directed graph G, we can maintain a phi expander, an order phi expander decomposition where the set R is an incremental set that in the end has size at most phi times n, right? Uh, and we can maintain all of this in total update time m over phi squared. Now I'll just paste over the corollary and the main theorem to the next slide so that I have a little bit of space. And now I'll design a decremental SCC algorithm. I've disconnected at this point. Uh, one second. All right, let's again. Um, so there's a Halper theorem essentially that Wonski already used in his paper and that says that if you're given a graph G and disconnect it again. Now let's try this one more time, otherwise I will try something else. All right. So the helper theorem says essentially that given a graph G and any incremental subset of vertices S uh, and a data structure that maintains at least the SECs of this graph. Okay. Uh, let me just figure out what to do now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, just wondering if there's anything I can do. No, no. I just had him on the iPad and now I'm trying to not use the iPad, I guess. Oh. can just share the entire screen like this. Can you see the slides again? Yes. yes. Okay. I'll continue like this. I think this is more stable. All right. One last time for the helper theorem. So um, essentially, it's exactly what we just discussed. It's that given a decremental graph G and an incremental subset of vertices S, and you have at least a data structure that maintains the SECs of G minus S throughout, 
Then there exists an algorithm that maintains the SECs of the entire graph G, uh, and you only pay time M times the vertices you took out of that graph. So essentially, this is a way of fixing uh, or pasting back in vertices that you deleted from that graph over, over time. And now it's kind of simple to get our algorithm with running time m and two thirds. Um, it's just you can set phi now to be order uh, one over n to the power of one third, and then you can see actually that you that the total update time to maintain the phi expander decomposition becomes just m n to the power of two thirds, and at the same time you're producing you're deleting from that graph roughly. Uh, n to the power two third vertices. So this helper theorem also runs in time m times n to the power two thirds. Uh, so combined, you get this perfect trade off and you get an algorithm that now runs really fast and gets the SECs in uh, the graph G. Perfect. All right. So this is really already it. This is already the decremental SEC algorithm. This is already like a huge breakthrough actually in, in the setting. And the rest of the talk will be to prove this main theorem now that we have given some clear motivation for it. Uh, and I'll just start with talking about, uh, talking a bit about how to get there. So in particular, this main theorem, we're going to prove in two steps. So um, there's two tools we really need. The first tool is going to be, we need an algorithm that just finds an expander, which means that given a graph G, uh, you don't even know whether it's a phi expander. So you need some algorithmic, uh, some algorithm that kind of certifies that G is a phi expander. And once you are given a phi expander, we need a pruning device. So this essentially uh, maintains the an expander over some time. So pruning on expanders is just a way to maintain it once you know that it's an expander. And first I'm going to focus on this first tool, which is finding an expander. And here the theorem will be that for any directed graph G, we can find a phi expander decomposition, a static one, in total time m over phi. Yes, all right. Now, how to do that? Um, the idea behind this is actually quite simple, but it's it sounds a bit uh, esoteric, I think, sometimes. You just embed an expander into a graph. Now, what does that mean? Well. Let's say you have a graph H and you already know that it's an amazing expander. So it's a half expander, say, um, which is an amazing quality. And you also have your graph G and G you don't really know, but you think it's a phi expander. Now for what you can do is for each edge in the graph H, you can essentially find a path in the graph G and assign it to that edge. And if you do that for every edge of H, then you can then this gives an embedding. And the folk, there's a folklore result, which is that if there exists such an embedding, so if you can for each edge U V in H map to a U to V path in G, and over that entire core in all of these paths through G, you're not using any vertex X on more than one over phi paths then you know that G is an order phi expander. So I'm going to repeat that just once. Um, essentially, you map each edge to a path in G, and then you look at all the paths that you have taken, and if you have not used any vertex on all the paths more than one over phi times, then you now know that G is a phi expander. And we will say that H is now a witness for G. So H is, is witnessing that G is, an, is also a good expander, a phi expander. Um, now I will say that this is not always true. Just because you're given an amazing expander, you cannot always hope to embed it uh, into the graph G 
And if you cannot embed it, this does not mean that the graph G is not a phi expander. However, there's a method to construct exactly the right expander H that you want to have. And this is what the cut matching game does. So there the credit goes to KRV. Uh, this is, I think, in stock 2006, and it's called the cut matching game, which is a really amazing algorithm. And the idea here is you have lock and faces, and in each phase, you essentially first have a cut layer, and he outputs a B partition of the vertex set into two equal sized sets, such as this one. So you have the blue set and the green set. And then you inject one unit of flow into the blue in the into the vertices of the blue set, and you take out one unit of flow in the from the vertices in the green set. So you construct a flow problem, and then you set the capacity of every vertex in the graph to one over phi. And then this cup layer hands off this um, this flow problem to a matching player. And this is the second player. The matching player will find a flow matching. So what this means is that he will find a flow that routes all the blue, um, all the units that we placed at blue vertices to a green vertex um, on a flow path. And if you take a flow path decomposition, you can actually figure out which blue vertex sent one unit of flow to some other green vertex. So that actually there is a matching between every blue uh, to some green vertex. So it looks something like this. So in particular, this matching player constructs a match, uh, uh, a matching, and it has some flow representation beneath the matching. Now let's say that this will carry on for some rounds because it always succeeds. So again, I might inject some flow at the blue vertices here and take out flow from the green vertices and map. And in this flow problem, always set the capacities, the vertex capacities to one over phi. And I'll find another matching. And in the end, I will have these log n matchings. Now, let's say that, and now you can take your graph H as the union of all the matching edges that you have constructed. So. Here you can see like a big red graph now, and you can see a black graph. And the red graph is your graph H, uh, which is our amazing expander, and the black graph is our original graph. And now you see that actually H can be embedded into G uh, with the vertex uh, to, to prove that it's an order uh, phi expander. And to see this, you just have to observe that in the flow problems, we had vertex capacities 1 over phi. So this means that you could actually find the path, the flow path, underlying to each matching edge, uh, and you used only every vertex 1 over phi times because that is, is its congestion, right? That, that is the maximum capacity of that vertex. Uh, after that, it is full. So you know that in each round, you only have used every vertex one over on one over five paths. So over log and rounds, you only have used every vertex a logarithmic over five number of times. And in the end, if you implement the cup layer correctly, this is a bit tricky, but then you can actually prove that H is a really good expander, and then you will use this for a claw result, and you know that G is actually uh, a phi expander using this technique. All right. Now, here I oversimplified a lot. Um, in particular, there might be the case that this flow problem is actually not solvable. In particular, the matching player might just get this flow problem here on the, on the right hand side, and now he will, by the cut, uh, by, the, by the max flow, min cut duality, just return a min cut and say it can actually not route all the n half units of flow that I injected into the blue side of the vertex set. And in this case, it's perfectly fine for the matching player to just give us this min, uh, min cut between x1 and x2. 
So here I drew one min cut in that graph because every flow path has to go through that vertex. So most like so most likely if you find a min cut here, this is the vertex that is congested. Now I'll assume that actually this min cut will separate a large frag like is quite balanced, so that actually the set x1 um, that you separate from the uh, that you have a large fraction of x1 on the one hand side and a large fraction of x2 on the other side of the min cut, um, so that you have roughly n vertices on both sides. And if you make that assumption, then you can see that this is also a phi sparse cut, this min cut. And the reason that this is true is just because the weight of the min cut is equal to the number to the amount of flow we could send, so it's at most n. But we gave capacity one over phi to all the vertices, so this means there's only phi n vertices in the min cut, and we have n vertices on both of the cuts on both sides. So this means that taking this min cut is just a sparse cut. Now this argument also kind of works once you once the sets are not so balanced, but I will actually brush this under the rug um, and just ask you to assume it's always a very balanced cut. And this actually already gives us a very good uh, thing. This actually gives us all we need because now we can actually construct um, a phi expander decomposition. And the idea is very simple. You just use this cut matching game. And whenever there's a balanced sparse cut found, you either add the out neighborhood or the in neighborhood of S, the smaller side of the cut, to the set R. Uh, and remember, this is just a sparse cut. And then you restart the cut matching game on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the min cut or the sparse cut. So in particular, on the graphs induced on S minus R and on not S minus R. And the running time for this total uh, whole algorithm is that every vertex really is only in a polylogarithmic number of calls here. Um, that is just because since all the cuts are balanced, you know that after a logarithmic number of cuts that an edge participated in, it is a uh, vertex participated in, it's just going to be isolated. And then this whole thing stops, the recursion stops. But at the same time, each cut matching game can be implemented in m over phi time. The reason is that you can use a blocking flow which routes um, over one over phi rounds. And after that many rounds, you can actually also board and just get a sparse cut out of that uh, right away. And this gives total time order m over phi to construct this phi expander decomposition. Uh, yeah, and I will warn you, this this whole thing, it's, it's roughly working like this, but this is really an extreme oversimplification. So I didn't tell you how the cut player is implemented, and it's not so easy to implement this the cut player deterministically. Um, I brushed under the rug what happens with cuts that are not balanced, um, and there's a whole lot of other subtleties to this proof that you actually have to go through, but I will not cover here because it's a bit tedious. Um, but you're, I'm happy to answer questions regarding that. All right, and now our second tool is expander pruning. So we move out on now to the second tool. Um, and in expander pruning, so the rough idea is you're given your expander graph G that you can see down there. And over time, some edges are deleted, and essentially this pruning algorithm identifies a small set, this red set, um, that can be pruned out, and the rest, or that, that can be taken, and the rest of the graph is then still a phi expander. So here's another edge that is deleted from that graph, and that might like grow the set P a bit, and you can prune out more and more of the graph, but this pruning is actually quite slow in the sense that the, the, the set you are pruning out is quite small. So let's actually go through the theorem at least once. Um, so for 
any phi, uh, once you're given a directed phi expander G undergoing edge deletions, you can actually maintain an incremental set vertex at P, so this this red set, such that after the ith edge deletion, the graph G uh, without the vertices in P is a uh, phi to the power roughly log log n expander, and P is of size 1 over phi to the O log log n um, times i, and the running time is roughly proportional to the size of i. Now, you will realize that actually we are using phi um, in our application with some polynomial factor, and raising that to the power of roughly log log n is really not an option for us. But there's a very simple workaround, and that is instead of taking of pruning G, let H again be the uh, be the really good expander uh, expander that witnesses that G is a phi expander. What you can now do is, since we are given that graph H explicitly from the cut matching game, we can actually run the pruning on this graph H. So in particular, this means that whenever we have an edge deletion, we will have to destroy up to 1 over phi matching edges, but direct to the graph H. So we really produce 1 over phi updates to the graph H. But on the other hand, um, this graph H can be pruned very efficiently because its phi is some very small, uh, some very large uh, value, so roughly constant or very close to that. So raising it to the power of log log n is not really an issue. And then it's kind of nice that once you know that, once you have that set P that now refers to the graph H, you know that taking out the vertices in P from H certifies that actually G minus the vertices in P is still a phi expander. I just wanted to point out that we, we lost the slides, but... Like you cannot see it? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Just a moment ago. I'm sorry. Uh... Well, it disconnects a lot, even though I'm not... I could also just share my entire screen. I cannot do that. Can you see them again? Yeah, now it's back on. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so in particular, you can actually prune the witness, and that way you can actually get um, a way better um, pruning guarantee on G here. Um, all right. I'll carry that over to now give our like main theorem. Um, and there will be like a subtle thing in the main theorem that I'm going to address in a second. So in particular, we get an additional factor of m over n uh, in that main theorem that I'm going to remove later. But let's focus on what we get here. These two results of finding an expander decomposition first and then pruning. What we essentially get is you take the, f the fo following algorithm, you compute the expanders x1, x2, and so on in g, and whenever an edge is deleted from one of these subgraphs, you actually forward it to the witness hi, which means that you, um, which reduces the set and the size of hi by roughly one over five vertices, right? Because it's roughly that number of, uh, of paths that you have to lead from hi. So pruning reduces the number of vertices by one over five. And then when hi has less than half the size, you essentially recompute it and recompute a witness for G X I. So you uh, find a new H I. Um, but as long as it has half the size, we are actually quite happy here. Um, all right. And the analysis for this is quite straightforward. We have a graph H I that has a uh, order and edges. And if we cannot certify a large uh, sorry. We have a, a 
witness hi that has roughly n uh, n vertices, right? Sorry, it's not edges, it's vertices here. And we cannot certify a large expander in GXI after n over phi edge deletions. Uh, sorry. This is actually phi times n edge deletions because after that, essentially, you pruned out half the vertices from your graph hi, and then you cannot certify that there's even a large expander in your induced graph. No, that's correct. Um, but this means that you actually have to recompute the expander witness roughly m over n phi times because you have to restart any every n phi edge deletions. Um, and you do that each at cost m over phi for the, taking a new expander decomposition on it. Uh, this is also the cost of pruning. And then if you're just multiplying these two factors, you actually get the total update time m times m over n over phi squared. All right. Um, and now go over to the last technique. But if you have questions, this would uh, would actually be a good good time to ask them. So uh, people should feel free to write questions in, in the chat or in the question section. There are sort of two different ways to pose questions. I guess I'll ask one just, is there something to know about kind of how the expander decomposition goes through in in this directed setting versus in the undirected? Can you, can you say more about? Actually, the proof is very similar. Um, okay. There's really not so much adaption that you need. What's really different is the pruning part. Um, I didn't cover that so much here, but that is very, that is kind of different. You need a, a whole new thing to, to actually make pruning work. And then the cut matching game, you actually have to kind of incorporate some part of pruning, which is uh, to make it efficient uh, that I also didn't explain here so much, but you need to have like some very good pruning in the first place. And can you say one more time what, what the actual decomposition statement is? I just want to see again yeah, sure. uh, what goes into the bank. So, ah, yeah. so the actual decomposition statement is that you can find a bunch of disjoint vertex subsets, x1, x2, x3, such that the induced graph is a graph g of xi, are directed phi expanders. And then you have a set R of few vertices that you can delete from the graph. Mm -hmm. Once you deleted these vertices R, these few vertices in R, and you contract all the expanders, then all, all you have left is a DAG. Mm -hmm. And can you get a... I'm not sure if is is there an analogous statement that cuts a certain fraction of the edges and gives edge expansion? Yes. Yeah. So there's exactly the same statement. So essentially, you get a set R of at most phi m uh, edges such that g minus R, um, and then the contractions of the expanders is also a DAG. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Essentially, you can actually just like split each edge by putting in a vertex, and this will give it to you right away. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll carry on with the last part um, since this is almost done. So the final part is getting rid of this m over n factor that I have in the running time still. And for this, we need like a last technique that is called congestion balancing. And so far, we have only put uh, order n vertices in our uh, witness. And that is kind of too little because of, this really means that after phi n deletions, edge deletions, we might have deleted all the edges from the witness. And the idea here is to just put more edges into the witness. And in particular, what we do is we adapt our cut matching game by finding a fractional flow matching. So in particular, we will also have some edge capacities that we now add to the graph. And these edge capacities initially are just one over the average degree. This is just the initialization. And then you try to, to still find uh, a flow matching 
but now these flow matchings are fractional and there will be order m edges in that witness graph in the end. And the new algorithm in this congestion balancing game that is incorporated is essential, tells you essentially that if you have this flow problem and your, your min cut now instead of uh, being uh, a vertex cut, so a phi sparse vertex cut that you could return is instead now an edge cut because you set these edge capacities to be quite, quite uh, close to, to what you can get. Then you can just take that edge, uh, that edge min cut and you can double all the edge capacities and then just restart the entire cut matching game. And what we can show, uh, I'll brush over this since I'm a bit late in the talk. What we can show is that with a, with a very nice, uh, analysis that will be a bit hand wavy here is you can essentially let ke be the current edge capacity that you induced in these gra uh, induced graphs graphs and now you induce a cost function ce that is just the logarithm of the um, of the edge capacity uh, times the average degree to make it a reasonable number um, and now you can consider some kind of uh, the min cost flow embedding. So this is just the cheapest flow that would uh, for for some matching player to um, embed some witness into the graph G. Um, and you can actually see that since each vertex only routes one over five units of flow, you know that the total cost. Um, of this min cost flow embedding is always bounded by n over phi, simply because there's not more flow going through and then the cost will always be logarithmic on every edge. And now what you can do is you can actually see that, uh, uh, proof that every time that you double the edge capacities in a large min cut, the min cost flow embedding cost will increase by n. And the reason is that we, since we double all these edge capacities in this min cut, the cost function increases by one for each of these edges. But still, every unit of flow has to be routed through that min cut. So that, that means that the cost of routing through that min cut will now go, go up by one per unit of flow that you're sending through that min cut. And since it's a balanced min cut, you will actually uh, increase the cost of this min flow cost embedding by at least n. And this will actually mean that in the end you have at most one over five doubling steps because then you reach this maximum cost. And this makes also a lot of sense because you uh, will not increase the edge capacities indefinitely because once they are as large as the vertex capacities, you will just get a vertex cut and that is actually a real sparse cut that you can take. And finally, um, since you add at most n over phi total edge capacity over all these iterations, because you only have one over phi uh, doubling steps, you know that every time this, the witness is destroyed, and you know that every time that the witness is destroyed, we move at least, we remove at least n capacity, because you have to delete n edge, uh, n capacity from the graph before it is uh, falling apart before this witness is unuseful. You know that after one over five rounds, you essentially uh, no, longer, no longer can find a big expander in your graph GXI. All right. I think that might have been a bit fast, but really um, I wanted to give you one, one brief outlook on this congestion balancing technique that is very nice uh, if you get a bit into the details. Uh, I'll just give a very brief summary of what we have seen today. Um, so essentially, we can break this MN barrier for uh, the problems of SSR and SCC. And actually, you can even extend this to get single source shortest paths uh, beyond MN. And we have seen these two techniques. Um, one is for some new tools for expanders and directed graphs and some new notions and concepts that are hopefully useful for many other problems. And I have touched a bit on the congestion balancing for expanders. And this is a technique to maintain the vertex 
expander decomposition very efficiently, it might have a lot of a uh, lot more applications to just maintaining a flow in decremental graphs. Uh, we have recently found like a application to matching, um, but there might be many more. Um, yeah, thanks. That concludes the talk. So let's uh, thank Max, but also if you have any questions, now is a good time to write them. Or you can ask for us to put you uh, on video if you prefer to ask your question that way. Am I on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you mentioned applications. So, um, what are relevant applications of, let's say, decremental uh, SCC? And do you actually also get improvements uh, on the runtime for these applications? Um, so, applications for decremental SCCs, for example, there are some applications to Markov decision processes and so on. So I think there in, in simulations, you essentially get smaller and smaller edge rates until you like delete some edges and that you can essentially model with a decremental SEC structure. But I'm not really so familiar with it. I just have seen that people used it. Um, and for the, but like my main application would be for the single source shortest path problem that if you would get it deterministically and decremental and then of M time, you could actually solve max flow in the same time. Um, so directed exact max flow, even though you only solve decremental approximate single source of this pass. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think it has a lot more applications um, beyond that. I mean, especially in, in the field of dynamic graph algorithms, we use it often as a like data structure to build something more complicated. So it's, it's probably worth mentioning just that, that approximate single source shortest path, the reason it does max flow is that it's uh, you can use it as an oracle, right, in the multiplicative weights. Is that correctly understood? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So that would seem to be a lot more general. Like this could probably be a good oracle for a lot of flow problems, right? Or Yes. I think like, yeah, that's, that's true. Like you also get like things like, sparse cuts, directed sparse cuts, and so on. There's a lot of reductions going from there, right? Like just max, getting max flow leads to a lot of applications. That would be one avenue to pursue. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, let's uh, thank Max again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for giving the talk. That was, that was super interesting. Uh, and I think now you're going off to give uh, the talk about this at Fox, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, have fun. So, um, to everyone else, I can just say that, you know, normally we have, try to have the speaker stick around a little bit afterwards, but unfortunately this time we don't because Max has to go give another talk uh, right away. But you should still feel free to, to check into these chat sessions and say hello if, if you want. So I'll be there for a few minutes at least. Uh, afterwards, you can click the, the sessions and then you can click uh, informal gathering. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Max. Bye. So I think Sylvia will wrap up the main session now. If you want, go click on